Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the City of Bettendorf Committee of the Whole Meeting. Today is Monday, December 5th, 2022. It's 5 o'clock. Thank you all for being here. We start today's agenda with a presentation uh, from the Quad City Chamber of Commerce. And for introductions, we'll turn it over to our City Administrator, Decker Plain, who is asked to do the honor. <laughs> Thank you, Your Honor. Um, the Council, uh, in our goal setting in October, uh, asked if we could have a little more regularity to our business updates from our uh, partners, both at the Chamber and Visit Quad Cities uh, and by state And so as part of what has been kind of a, uh, at least a quarterly update, Julie's been coming, but tonight we have a special treat um, in Ladrina coming as well. So for those of you that don't know Dr. Ladrina Wilson, she uh, has her PhD in educational leadership from Iowa State. She has a master's from Western Illinois and a bachelor's degree in public relations uh, and advertising from Northern Arizona and is a Quad City native. She took over the chamber as the CEO in July of this year. Um, and Julie is the senior vice president for business and economic growth. So you got the power of the chamber sitting in front of you. And um, we thought our regular update uh, not only would be helpful, but uh, since Ladrina took over uh, as CEO, we thought that um, introducing her to you as well as her giving you some perspective on what she now sees after about six months might be helpful. So with that, um, Julie and Ladrina, or Ladrina and Julie, depending on who's going to take what first. So Welcome, ladies. We're glad you're here. Thank you. Thank you. Do I need to, can you hear me okay? Nope, we got you. Okay, perfect. Uh, well, first and foremost, I appreciate the invitation to be able to uh, chat with you all. Um, I see a couple of familiar faces and, and online as well, and so uh, nice to see folks again. I just wanted to share a little bit with you all, um, specifically as it relates to how I see the work of the Quad Cities Chamber, um, the, work that, the work that we're doing in our business and economic growth area, and the, the continued partnership that we have here with the city of Bendorf. Um, as you know, we take a regional approach to our business and economic growth. We look at what's happening across the region. We get RFPs, excuse me, RPIs, am I using, I'm using the wrong letters, but we have our site selectors that use a regional approach to really vet the assets that are across the region. Julie will give you additional details about how that's been going, but I do want to let you know that the power of the team um, is pretty uh, dynamic and, and highly impactful. Uh, they work on a number of projects over the year. I believe we went over about 57 uh, projects that have come in as potential businesses here in the region. Um, and this work uh, entails really selling the assets that are here that you provide in your city, but the assets across the region. For, for folks that are familiar with business and economic growth, you know that if you have 57 projects that you're working on, you're lucky to get a yield of one or two. And so sometimes it can be very hard for people to see what's actually happening behind the scenes. But I like to equate the work that Julie and her team do as uh, ducks on a pond. So while they may seem like they're going across the water like this, their feet are flapping like crazy underneath. Um, and they continue to position our region and specifically this city um, as a place that people want to live, work, and play. She's going to give you some specific details about projects that she has uh, and how her team has been spending their time over the past year or so. But I want to let you know that Bendorf continues to be a great partner to the extent that you do think regionally. Uh, we, it's hard sometimes for people to recognize that by your investment in the chamber and allowing us to really feature this area as a region, irrespective of where a business locates it, it's a win for all of us because people are gonna live all over our quad cities. And uh, as you all know, uh, you have had a lot of growth in terms of your population growth, comparatively speaking, and people are choosing uh, this community. So irrespective of where a business locates, we do truly see this as an opportunity for uh, the, the city to continue to partner with us so that we can attract new businesses here. Additionally, we have benefited from uh, partnerships separate from this, but our uh, downtown uh, Bettendorf organization continues to uh, think regionally as well in creating amenities and assets and experiences for people not only in Bettendorf, but also across the Quad City region. If you go in the Wayback Machine, a lot of folks didn't even necessarily know that there was a downtown Bettendorf. It wasn't clearly identified. And so we continue to work at the chamber to make sure people know all that is great that's happening here in the downtown area as well. So with that, I, uh, the last thing that I would leave you with is 
things. Um, we have been doing quite a bit of listening. Decker's been part of some of those listening sessions and, and representing the interests of the city, uh, both in a board capacity and, and also providing uh, guidance, leadership, and input. Um, same with the mayor. And uh, I think that's a humble posture that we will continue to have at the chamber. We do not have all the answers. But it's our responsibility to really um, have our ear uh, to the ground to be able to hear what's important to the people in this region. And so as we do that and move into the next strategic phase uh, for our organization, we're in year three of a three-year work plan. And as we round the corner on that, uh, we hope that you as uh, investors in the chamber see um, your fingerprint on the final product that is our strategic plan. Um, I don't imagine that our work will look incredibly different, but I do think the measures around how we measure success might. And it, we recognize that it needs to resonate with not just what industry jargon is as it relates to a successful chamber, but really what matters here in the Quad Cities. Things we've heard include uh, net new jobs, um, not just how many projects are we getting in the community, but how many people are getting really mean, real and meaningful employment. And so we'll continue to listen. Um, and um, I wanna let you know as a council, you have excellent staff here in the city that, that do provide your feedback um, to us so that we can make sure that we are um, honoring what you think is important in our region. And with that, I will turn it over to Julie to give some particulars around um, how her and her team have been spending their time. Thanks, Ladrina, Mayor, Becker, Council, staff. Julie, Good to see everybody. Julie, pull your mic a little bit closer. Sure. How's there you go. that? Yeah, perfect. Okay, good. I'm going to move pretty quickly here. So um, who we are, we're a nonprofit uh, dedicated. We want a <coughs> prosperous region where all can thrive. Um, six counties, again, regionally. Um, what we do, we really uh, fill that space where we're facilitating business growth by advocating for business, providing resources, and building networks. Um, tonight, we're going to talk about uh, business and economic growth, but as you can see by the, the uh the pillars there, there's uh, three major areas that we work in, um, supported by a strong chamber. Um, this is our uh, flywheel, and this is important because it really shows why we're in the, in the segments that we're in. Investment in the region um, helps support existing business, um, helps uh, the place making and place management, a place where people want to be, which in turn attracts and re uh, retains uh, the people in the workforce that our businesses need, both the existing businesses and the businesses um, that are looking to come to the region. Um, here's the team. Uh, we're a sector-based uh, outreach organization. So uh, Chris Caves does manufacturing and defense, Tammy Petchy, corporate office, logistics, and warehouse. And we have two on our project management team that uh, manages all the projects, both uh, expansion locally and then our attraction. Um, so as a reminder, um, we do external marketing for the region that comes in both uh, traditional and digital formats. And so there's a lot of ads and marketing that goes out to targets outside of our region. That's why you don't see them. Um, those come back as leads to the chamber that we work. Um, so we do outreach to site selectors. Um, we talk to decision makers at companies and we also talk to multipliers and that's anybody that helps make a decision about um, getting a business here to the region and can be supportive of that. So um, as Ladrina mentioned, a large pipeline, we're lucky if we get one or two. We were lucky to get one. You may have seen this in June announced, the groundbreaking for the Fair Oaks Foods um, specialty bacon uh, uh, a plant. It's very, um, very technologically advanced plant, but it's 182 million annual economic impact to the region. Um, this is the 12th largest black owned business in the United States that uh, chose to expand here. So we are um, very lucky to have them. This actually came about because um, Tammy Petchy on our team had a relationship with a site selector and we had another project that was codenamed Project Silver and that went down the path pretty far, but we ended up being number two. And in, uh, in business attraction, you don't get anything for number two. But it was because of that relationship that the, she had, the site selector remembered the Quad Cities and called us. So that's why we're always working those relationships. So this was a relationship 
um, success project for sure. So we manage lots of projects, prospects, um, both in the lead generation area, but also the project management. So we're the single point of contact for the entire region as projects come in from the state. Um, uh, if, if they come in from Iowa, we can only look at Iowa. If they come in from Illinois, we can only look at Illinois. If it's a, if it's a lead sourced anywhere else, it's fair game and we can try to get them anywhere in the Quad Cities region that makes sense based on their search criteria. Um, and then another thing that uh, you all look for us to do is identify emerging trends and, and really understand what site selectors are wanting. And so um, right now we have a targeted industry study underway. It's the second one. We already did one on two of our major sectors, ag and food processing and, and manufacturing. This one uh, due in February is going to tell us what we need to know about corporate office, which is going to be very interesting to see based on everything that happened during COVID. Um, and then also warehouse distribution and defense. So we will share that with all of our economic development partners so that they can understand as well what's going on out there. Um, we, ha we hosted a site selector fam familiarization tour this summer. And so um, that was inviting four site selectors to come to the Quad Cities and be on the ground and really understand what it's like to be here. It's one thing to talk about it. It's one thing to send them photos. It's another thing to send them a video, but it's entirely different to be there, be here. And so um, we feel that this is a really great way to um, show the assets of the region um, and the people and the, and the workforce that make up the region, the partners that we have. And so we did a number of things over three days, one of which was uh, they got a chance to have roundtable discussions with uh, business owners, uh, business leaders. What is it actually like to do business in the region? Um, there were some Buttendorf businesses involved with that. We took them around in a land jet all throughout the region, um, worked with our partners. Jeff helped get us set out at the, up at the TBK Bank complex and one of the restaurants out there for all the workforce partners to, to meet and talk to them about uh, workforce training and education and the pipeline within the region. Um, they also had a chance to meet with the site selectors one-on-one -on -one, um, as we hosted different events. So total immersion experience, trying to get them on the ground, really understand our area. And so that is something that was very successful. And we hope to do that again um, on a more regular basis moving forward. Uh, key takeaways, these are all the items that they said are extremely important to them um, and when they're looking at uh, regions, and, and we score very high on all of these, and I will say that uh, really Jeff did a great job sharing the story that was really able to uh, provide evidence of speed to market and regional collaboration, talking about the whole process of getting the TB, TBK bank complex up and running and how everybody worked together on that. Um, and they really gave us um, some good insights. So again, helping to bring information to you and all of our regional partners about what we need to do to be more competitive. It's it's um, something we always need everybody everybody's help with, and we appreciate that. Um, within business retention and expansion, we do outreach to our primary um, industry businesses through our business connection programs. That means we go out and talk to them, what's working, what's not working, do you have plans to expand, what's keeping you from growing and understanding that. Um, workforce is the number one issue that is keeping businesses from expanding. We've done a lot of resource assists in that particular area over the last year and really mapping out who are all the different uh, right now workforce resources that businesses can leverage so that they can get the talent they need. Um, all kinds of technical assists and resource facilitation. Um, so we keep track of those um, over our time. Um, one of the biggest lifts that we, we did for uh, Bettendorf is uh, there was uh, grant dollars available through the Iowa Economic Development Authority, manufacturing 4.0 grants. The point of those grants is to help businesses invest in technology that they <coughs> otherwise wouldn't be able to do on their own and help them with that risk. So there are four companies here that uh, Chris Caves them um, provide them opportunity of letting them know that this is a grant that's available to them and help walk them through that process. And you can see the awards, that's a total of $1.5 million in grant awards going to these Bettendorf businesses. Again, investment of technologies to increase their capacity. These do not supplant workforce. Um, it allows them to do more and uh, take some of those folks and, and upskill them into other roles. So we're happy that that was a 
big success. Um, and then also we have a, uh, we were just awarded in the last uh quarter here, a grant that you may have heard about. It's additional support for our manufacturing and defense contractors. So it'll be $675,000 to the Quad Cities over five years um, regionally to help our manufacturing and defense sector. And it will uh, do things such as uh, help create a center of excellence model for digital castings and foundries, um, also uh, supply chain diversification, um, and then also building the skill, skilled workforce, focusing on uh, introducing minority and women uh, com uh, communities to manufacturing. Um, so those are some of the high notes. We're working on that program of work, and that's what we've been working on um, since I think the last time I saw you here. I'm happy to take any questions if you have any. Any questions for our friends at the chamber? Look at left. Yes, Scott. Thank you, Honor. So when the chambers merged in 2010, we started really publicly advocating for a regional model. And yet we would often hear that when folks would look at our community, they would see us not as a region, but as individual communities and so forth, like the Trader Joe's and so forth. They didn't really care. We're, we're like, we're, we're 500,000 people here. I wonder if the bridge, is it too soon yet to tell the impact of, because it's so darn easy to cross now, <laughs> does that then translate into how they look at us and how they traverse through our community to truly be a region? Go ahead. Well, well first I would say, I, I wish we were 500,000. <laughs> that would be really great news. We're about 450,000. Well, when you look but, at the grand, you know, the area we touch, I mean, I think that, it's pretty close. I mean, but I just don't He's know. He's an that optimist. We're perceived, yeah, I think. Right? I think. I think there are a few things that are in our way. <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew that was going to come up. That was a soft. Fifty-nine thousand one hundred six. So very close. I, I would say that there are a few things that are in place that um, aren't necessarily specific to the chamber, but certainly we support and champion. Uh, part of the, the regional thinking um, has happened internally, and now it's time for us to move it externally. Um, if you drive our I-80 corridor, there's no reference to the Quad Cities. You don't know us. You know that you're in Davenport. You know that you're in Ben. We still don't have that kind of to that external facing um, potential, you know, customer or visitor and that type of thing. So I think there's some branding things that we could do to enhance that. I do think that from the work, the perspective of what, you know, the team does in business and economic growth, we're we're a lot further along than even we are in the space of, of, of placemaking and how people experience our community from a, a livability and vibrancy uh, type of perspective. While I think from the inside, we would hope that things would move a little bit quicker, um, I can tell you that there's a little bit more context for what the Quad Cities is as I travel outside of the area as well. So I think we're making baby steps. Um, I think the bridge is still really new for people to, you know, to see us in that way. But I do think there's some work that's happening across the region that will enhance what's already there in that asset of, of the bridge. But I also think we have an opportunity to expand on the river as being in the Quad Cities, right? And how we talk about that as an asset for the Quad Cities. So there's some things that are in the works and, and we have a ways to go. So does that regional Quad City brand, is that, do we think a chamber initiative it, it started off that way, and I think we all have ownership for it now. We'll, con we'll continue to beat that drum, um, and I don't see that changing uh, because to your point around how do people see us as a, a six-county region, we need that, especially for business and economic growth. Um, I can't answer to, um, I think it's a, another place that would be an advantage to it is to an extent, the work that around the Rock Island Arsenal. Yes, it's on Rock Island, but that is a regional asset. And so the more we play up those regional assets and recognizing how many folks are actually employed as, a re as it relates to the Arsenal and kind of just really, no matter where they come from, Iowa, Illinois, Bettendorf, wherever it is that they are, we need to let we need to continue to beat that drum and we continue to carry that message in every space that we get. Now, what happens when people decide they want to do their, their own parochial type of thing. Um, you know, we advocate to keep going the regional route, but there is a, a, a sense of pride around some of the specific communities. I think my guidance would be is it's, it's okay to have pride in what your part of the region is, but let's not duplicate effort. Let's make sure that we're working alongside one another to not try to reinvent the wheel if it's already a neighboring community. Thank you, thank you, Your Honor. You bet. Other questions? No? All right.
Madrina and Julie, thank you very much for being here today. We appreciate that. You're welcome to stick around for the rest of the meeting, but if you have other things to do, <laughs> we certainly would understand if you're leaving, especially since they have apparently fed us, thinking they're going to keep us for several hours this evening. <laughs> All right, they'll well, be, they'll be here a while. <laughs> thank, I want to say thank you for the opportunity for us to be able to share a little bit about uh, what we do with you, but also thank you for your service. Um, my time at the chamber has allowed me to be able to attend quite a few more council meetings than I had in the past. Um, and so um, it's not lost on me how much time, effort, and energy you all put into what you do. Um, so thank you for being willing to do that. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, team. All right. <clears throat> Mark's going to have a whole bunch here, Your Honor. Mark's got a seven spot today. <clears throat> so he's going to come to the front, and I'm sure we get some pictures and all kinds of things as he attacks many of your consent agenda items. Some of these would be multiple presentations in one, Your Honor. So Understandable. These first several look to be that kind of a thing. I, J, and K, L, and OP. <laughs> Daryl Brickner from FG Holdings is here in case we have questions as we start going that direction because we start with FG Holdings. Ladies and gentlemen, the Director of Community Development, Mr. Mark Hunt, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Members of the Council, I just need a couple seconds here to load my presentation. It is saved on the drive. I just got to get to it. <clears throat> Is Alderman Nauman keeping that seat? <laughs> you have first dibs, no worries. Yeah, Lisa. It's a tonight only bargain. Alderman Sexer announced that he had a, a cold, and so Alderman Nauman moved <laughs> rapidly to your seat. Jerry's always so willing to share. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. Uh, all right, Mark, you have the floor. The good news is I am recovered. I no longer have it. Whatever it <laughs> I've was. I've tested negative. Hey, I thought it was funny. <laughs> it was <laughs> funny. It was. <laughs> All right, to the gossip. matter at hand. Mr. Hunt. Your Honor, if it pleases you and the council, I will uh, provide you a, um, a presentation that, in, that combines multiple cases, um, if that's okay. So. Um, totally fine. We'll thank ask you. questions at the end. <laughs> So I'm going to go case 22072, 073, 074, and 084. Do we have a bingo? Uh, that's yeah. lots one, two, and three of FG80 Holdings. You're going to be very familiar with this site by the time I'm done with this. And I've done some uh, kind of cute color coding on my presentation that I think you're really going to be uh, impressed with. At least I was. Uh, <laughs> and lot, lot four of FG80. This is a really hard story to tell, folks. Work. It's, it, it really, it's a great story to tell, but it's, it's a little bit hard to tell just to keep all the subdivision, plat, lot numbers all in, in shape here. So I've done my best. <clears throat> I'm sure this is a piece of property you're all uh, familiar with. This is um, FG80. We have two applicants involved in these four cases. Applicant one, color-coded, I will call that a yellow or an orange, is Kevin Kellner, lots one, two, and three. They're gonna be kind of in this quadrant when we get a little closer in here. And color-coded in, in that uh, brown is Joel Jackson, Bishop Engineering, Lot 4. He's representing McDonald's Corporation, uh, FG Holdings 81st edition. <clears throat> Don't get too lost into what what edition, what subdivision we're in. Just kind of orient yourself on the map, and we'll just kind of go from there. Um, there's going to be a, some omitted plats coming in anyway. Uh, you may have noticed you don't see a final plat for some of these items. Um, that's because we were already aware of changes that are coming down the road. So these are all site development plans, four buildings on four lots. Um, and again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about which subdivision we're in because really, once you orient yourself, you'll be fine. Proposed uses are office, retail, restaurant, and fast food. Just some background information. We do have a C3 zoning district here. We have a future land use that is community commercial. These are all consistent uses. Uh, nothing to really mention here. Okay, remember our color coding. Uh, Kevin Kilner's uh, the yellow or orange color and the brown coloring is Joel Jackson's representing uh, McDonald's Corporation. So we'll kind of go through all three of these and we'll leave that color coding so you know which one we're talking about. The star 
matches uh, Kevin Kiltner's applications, and the the brown color matches Joel Jackson and McDonald's. Um, so here's a here's a final plat. Um, again, this final plat is going to be updated, so we're not bringing it to you today. We're just bringing the site development plans. We have lots one, two, and three of FG <coughs> Holdings third edition. Wasn't doing nothing. And lot four up here is not part of this subdivision. Um, but I won't bore you with the names because they're so similar. Getting a little closer on the site plan, let's start with the first one. We have a strip mall here. It's an office use, um, 64 stalls of parking. They've got 40 required. Of course, there's a builder to cross ease park uh, throughout this entire site. Um, vehicular access points come in from the north and from the east. <clears throat> We do have some turnarounds uh, built in here at the top of this site, if you will. We have a dumpster located in the northwest corner. It will be screened. We have sidewalk connectivity on the southeast corner. And we are recommending service walks be built um, by the developer to connect um, the public as they walk back and forth between these buildings. We know the use of this site being sports and entertainment. People are going to go back and forth from restaurants to games and, and so forth. So are those service sidewalks on the map or they're not? They're not on the map. We're going to let the developer kind of figure out the best spot to put those based on parking and where they end up putting equipment and those type of things. And those are all be private service walks. Those won't be city owned. The sidewalks, of course, uh, will be in our right away. So this is case 22072. We're going to keep going right down the line here. We'll stay with the star, uh, the yellow star here to denote where we're at. Um, here's your, here's your uh, landscaping plan. We've got uh, a pretty healthy tree factor here of 14 and a half that meets our requirement. Um, and you'll see a similar fashion as we move on down the line. Now we're next door. Uh, we just moved one lot to the east. This is case 22073. Again, uses the same infrastructure to get in, uh, the same shared parking spaces. Uh, multiple points for, for vehicle access uh, coming, you know, north, south, east, and west. And we have a dumpster location that is screened, and we do have the same sidewalk connectivity. Um, this one, we don't have the service walks called out per se, but again, this is all a hardscape lot. It doesn't um, connect directly to another lot, uh, or it doesn't have a boundary between another lot that would need a service walk across that boundary, excuse me. Here's your landscape. Plan, uh, 15 tree factor, very similar to the previous one. They're just going to do the edges, uh, plant where they can to get their tree factors in. And now we're at lot three. We've just moved another one to the east. Uh, 72 stalls. This is the biggest of these three strip malls. Uh, they only need 53 to meet the uses that they proposed. Again, multiple vehicle access points. We're coming in off Competition Drive, which is the horseshoe sh uh, shape drive here. Uh, screen dumpsters and sidewalk connectivity. I think you're getting in the pattern. <coughs> Here's some elevations of what the strip malls will look like in general. So uh, the front will have the, the main entries. There'll be, of course, signage above these doors. Um, and then the rear uh, employee entrance, parking, that type of thing. <coughs> and then your landscape plan. Um, this one has a, the largest tree factor. It is the largest lot, so that makes sense. Uh, meets all our requirements. Um, and we're also working on tree diversity, so that's something we're going to try and be a little more specific on as staff going forward is to maybe get away from everything being maple tree. So we're going to work on tree diversity. It's not really in our code. It's just a, a goal we have internally. So that finishes the Kevin Kellner uh, aspects of, of this presentation. I'm going to move on to the northwest. So to orient yourself, we just went Cattywampus to the northwest. Um, this is a fast food use, uh, McDonald's, 50 stalls, uh, 29 required, so it's well parked. Uh, two vehicle access points to get into the site uh, here <coughs> on the east side. We'll have a screen dumpster, we'll have sidewalk connectivity on the northeast corner, and we're recommending service walks but, um, to the adjoining lot. <coughs> Uh, most of this is done through striping. One of the things we're really trying to avoid uh, in the building department or community development department is um, getting locked in. So we, have, we don't want to have people that can't bail out. 
So what you see here is all done with striping. These are not walled or curbed. So if people are in those lines and they want to bail, they can. Um, we've learned some lessons with some other developments. So I just wanted to point that out to you. That's not a not a walled or curbed drive lane that is completely bailable, if that's a word. Uh, plenty of stacking and um, ADA spaces are marked and they'll be required, of course. Uh, our tree factors here, they're not shown in green, but you can see the outlines. We've got 13 tree factors. Uh, they meet our requirements. Uh, Donald's very particular and very does actually a very good job in their landscaping. So we don't expect any problems there. Now, this is where you get some extra credit because what I tried to do was match the colors of the McDonald's logo and the McDonald's building with the themes throughout the presentation to kind of keep you oriented and also bring it all back together. So hopefully that was uh, not missed by my audience. Um, so here's your, your, your elevation of the McDonald's. It's a more modern building than what um, maybe we're used to or the McDonald's we all grew up with or remember from the past, a little smaller profile. It will fit the, the surrounding environment, I think, very well. So I have some recommendations for you. I'll combine a few of them, and then I'll um, kind of go back over and answer any questions you might have. So again, color-coded here, we're doing the yellow uh, star. This is the Kevin Kellner applica application, 22-072 uh, specifically on lot one of FG80. Uh, staff did recommend approval with the two conditions you see there, and it was recommended unanimously by the Planning and Zoning Commission on 1116. Because they grew up with McDonald's. 22073 and 22074. Uh, these are both Kevin Kilner, again, applications for the other strip malls, the other two strip malls. Um, we have slightly different um, conditions with the interior pedestrian walks being one of those. We did have a positive staff recommendation and uh, an approval from the Planning and Zoning Commission on the 16th of November. And then case 22084, this is the McDonald's. Uh, applicant was Joel Jackson representing McDonald's Corporation. It's case 22084. Service walks were one of the um, conditions required, uh, similar to the others, and we did have a positive staff recommendation and a positive um, zoning commission recommendation. That gets us through the first four cases, I think. I, J, K, and I'm happy L. to answer any questions. I went as fast as I could. How about so some I'm happy questions to go back. on I, J, K, or L? Looking right. Looking left, we'll go Bill, then Scott, then Greg. Is uh, one of the conditions for McDonald's <coughs> based on the fact the site development plan has no validity until such time as the final plat is approved? We could add that as a condition. Um, I think that's, yeah. that's important. Yeah, so what happened is I think they want to... They want to combine and make the plats a little more sensible so that some of the lots aren't in separate plats that are on that island, if you will. And that's really what's going to happen. Um, but we haven't brought that forward. And because of some of the business considerations, we didn't want to delay that. But I think that would be a great condition. And I would be uh, happy to include that in the packet tomorrow. And, and then could we also go back to the uh, overall site development plan of the entire site. I want to see how McDonald's is going to be accessed again. Tell me when I get to the one you want. Probably go forward. There we go. This one? Probably there. Sorry. No, that's that's fine. Right there, Mark. Yep. So the only access to McDonald's is basically through adjoining parking lots. Yeah, you gotta come in through the north or the or the east. Is that acceptable to public safety people? That's the roundabout on middle to upper left, and this is mm -hmm. whatever that is competition, competition. maybe. Yep, competition. competition. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we didn't. We talked about is like Mark was talking about with the um, not having a curved drive-through, which allows better accessibility to move in and out just in case there was an incident. Um, they do have plenty of lane width and, and what have you for emergency access and, and radius and everything when we initially took a look at this. It, it is, Bill, it is sized for buses. That's what the four parking okay. stalls on the south end, yep. right which here. would be equivalent to our width. And, and if you look at the radius coming in off competition, mm -hmm. As you head east, you can see that's enlarged also. Yeah. Okay. Part of that was due to the lot configuration relative to the uh, the roundabouts. We right. had to get that sufficiently far enough the way that we did not impact traffic back into the roundabout. That, that I understand. <coughs> okay, thank you. Scott. Thank you, Your Honor. Can you re refresh the council's memory on the bailout 
lane policy because I, I think we all have agreed that there's a need for that. I love seeing it here, but is where are we going with those? Well, I think it will be a policy. It's it's right now, I'm going to say, more uh, staff procedure at this point. So we've just been recommending it. And everybody we've brought it up to has, uh, since we've had that recent development, has totally bought into it. I think with the new zoning ordinance that will come uh, post-comp plan, we can just add that in there, okay. that stacking requirement that has to have to build in the bailout somehow. Okay. Thank you. Greg? Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> Refresh my memory. Wasn't there supposed to be a hotel someplace? Yeah. Mm -hmm. There is. Um, that is not on the contemplated. Let me try and get back to a better picture here. <coughs> so that would be, have been in, in this location. It's just not one of the site development plans that we're bringing forward today. That will be forthcoming by... Um, okay. the developer in the future. Okay. So these are, are not a comment on that. It's just they haven't brought that forward yet. But that's that's tentatively where it would... Yeah, still in the game plan, <laughs> yep. Mm -hmm. Mark, if you go back to the FG80 site plans, <clears throat> it actually shows a true footprint. Why did I put so many slides in here? Far east a lot, yeah. Right here, I think, is the best we got, Brent. Uh, lot three, <coughs> if you go to that one, it shows the full. There you go. Here. Back up one more. There we go. Okay. So that is an actual footprint for the proposed hotel. They are just not ready to bring forward the site plan yet. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. You bet. Lisa, do you have any questions? No. Oh, no. Jeff, did you have something you wanted to add? Uh, just one quick item of note for Council Member Nam and Your Honor. When we looked at this on the escape lane, if you will, in the, de the development review, we noted that McDonald's is probably one of the strongest practitioners of such a model, and we thought it'd be a good prototype to help us build that case because they obviously have such a great success with utilizing that sort of model, similar to a Chick-fil-A or those others. They've, they've pretty much figured it out. So we were hopeful that that would be a good test case for us as we put that policy together. Uh, yeah. Oh, now you guys want to talk. All right, Jerry, then Frank. <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, follow-up well, question. Let's start going left yeah. first. <laughs> yeah. Well, f a follow-up question uh, to a question we already had. On the uh, hotel, will we have, will we have <coughs> appropriate service uh, sidewalks connecting to the hotel since that's not currently part of the package. Will, these, uh, uh, will a developer require these individual lots to put in the appropriate uh, I think we'd make sidewalks. that recommendation when we saw the site development plan that the hotel put those in. All right. Thank you. And then uh, an, another question on sidewalks is on Competition Drive, uh, who does snow removal on that sidewalk? Each individual o owner? No, the, Mark, the city will actually do oh. competition because there's going to be an eight-foot walk on either side of competition trail drive. Side, yeah. Okay, thank an eight you. Eight-foot trail, I should say. That won't get built till our next phase next spring, but that will be a city trail. But snow removal on the interior ones... Interior is them. ...is all the developers. Correct. Thank you. Frank. Thank you, Your Honor. Mark, can you go back to the slide that shows uh, the McDonald's and the landscaping? I can <clears throat> okay, that in and out right there, I'm assuming that that tree is going to be back far enough to give sight view for people coming and leaving the parking lot area. Yeah, we'll make sure that they don't put them in the in the sight line, and if they are, they can move them. You know, this is a little bit of a generalization here, so they have plenty of room to maybe move a little bit to the north, and you know. Okay. Okay, anything else on these items? All right, then I'd like to entertain a motion that consent agenda I remain on tomorrow night's agenda. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, same motion for Jay. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, K. So moved. Second. All those in favor? 
Aye. 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 Opposed. And L, please. Full move. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. I, J, K, and L will remain on tomorrow night's consent agenda for approval by council. We move to consent agenda M. Thanks, Your Honor. Uh, members of council, this is case 22087. It's at 2564 <coughs> Middle Road. It's a site development plan. You're going to be very familiar with this area of town. We had a lot of development here. Um, it's near the vintage co-op uh, apartments or condos, if you will. Uh, the zoning in this area is C2, uh, just north of M Middle Road. Um, what's coming before you is not the original site development plan. You may remember of a memory care um, type of facility that was going to be built. Uh, those plans are off the table. Uh, the petitioner's coming through with a townhouse type style development. Um, I would note it's also got a future land use designation of community commercial. Uh, the proposed use fits both within the uh, zoning and existing, existing zoning and future land use. Here's the final plat. Uh, it's already been through, through this body and just showing you the outline of this lot. It's a little bit of an odd shaped lot, kind of flag shaped. Um, it does have access points to the <coughs> south coming through the Northwest Bank parking lot and to the north connecting to Happy Joe Drive. Here you get a look at the site development plan. So uh, much less dense, if, uh, if you will, from what was originally proposed. I think that was a 64 unit complex. Uh, this is just 30 townhomes, has a floor area ratio, the acronym FAR, floor area ratio of 62%. That's well below the threshold. So that's the total area of all levels compared to the total area of, of the land, uh, which is 62% uh, or a 62% <coughs> ratio of floor area to land. Uh, we have 5,733 square feet per unit of land. Um, they only need 3,000 square feet, again, so we're, we're meeting our density calculations here, and that's the point of those two numbers. Uh, we've got utilities uh, following the existing easements, uh, same with water as well. Stormwater actually funnels to the north, just off the map on an outlot of the adjoining property. And uh, we do have a traffic study uh, that can be uh, um, conducted following this development. This completion, and then we'll, that will lead us to triggering our agreement for a possible turn lane or traffic control. Um, and Brent will be taking care of that. But um, right now, we've got to get through the building phase before we actually trigger that study. Seriously? I'm sorry. So the buildings are going to be occupied before we do the study? I believe they were going to let them permit the building and then do the study. Oh, okay. Just no, issue the permits. We yeah. probably ought to have them. You got to know who's coming and, the, and going, the, right? Yeah, the actual, the way it read was full build out. Yeah. Uh, of the build. We need to know where the traffic's going, whether they're actually using Happy Joe or whether they're coming out on the middle. Because that's what we actually, if you remember, we did a traffic study for this whole development, mm. but we used projected numbers. Mm. And it projected that it would still function, but we all saw some skepticism in the results of that using the projections. That's why we need to do an actual traffic study with actual splits to be able to see which way the traffic is going. Well, that's how the agreement read. Obviously, there are going to be a lot more trips from this site than there would be from a memory mm -hmm. care unit. Agreed. Yep, absolutely. Um, let's go back to the landscape plan. So here's your landscape plan, mainly pushed off to the west side um, where you'll be fitting in all the, the required landscaping. Of course, you have hardscape and you have um, travel easements to the west side. So that's the main location for that. Um, it's also buffering that commercial development that would be that direction. Um, some interior plantings as well. These are private drives on the interior, private drive lanes really uh, on the interior. Your right of way is really just Happy Joe Drive coming in from the north. Kind of a modern look, uh, three-story townhomes, lots of glass on the front, um, some uh, kind of cupolas or awnings. Um, Fairly good architecture, seems to match uh, with vintage co-op that's there already. We did have a positive staff recommendation and we did have a positive recommendation from Planning and Zoning Commission. There are a few um, conditions before you, uh, nothing out of the ordinary, to be honest with you. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Any questions for Mark? Greg. So there's 30 units mm -hmm. 
in three Each and four. Each one of those is an individual residence? Yeah, 30 individual residences. Three stories? Yep. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Bill. I'd, I'd still like a clarification on the traffic study. Normally, if you're going to do a traffic study, you do that prior to occupa occupancy of the, the site. I don't know if the agreement restricts you from doing that traffic study now based on what uh, assumed trips from this new development is going to be? So that's exactly what we did, Bill. We had Shive run one for the entire development. Now, I realize there will be more trips coming out of here, but that also projected <coughs> traffic from coming from the lot that remains on middle. So that traffic that was in, assumed to be a fairly high intense commercial use still didn't trigger that. So the fact that we're adding 300, yeah, if you go by the book, 300 trips a day um, from the townhome unit with still no traffic being generated from that commercial lot, it, it's almost certainly gonna be apples to apples. It's really until we see where those are all going, that's when it makes the most sense to run one. So we still, I can be happy to, to send that to you, but we have that study that Shive did. Okay, please do that. Sure. Jerry? Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I have a question. <coughs> where does the city's portion of Happy Joe Drive <coughs> on this on this drawing? Is that on the northwest or northeast corner? Is that all city street up there? No. Not until you're, it's actually off the map that you see here. So it would be up to the north, this. So none of that there, even though it's labeled Happy Joe Drive, that's not part of the city's. Correct. Okay, yep. thank you. Then all the all the roadway on the Ewing property is private. Okay. Provide no city services. Uh, second question is, uh, you'd be disappointed if I didn't ask a sidewalk question. Uh, on this drawing, they show all their sidewalks is only four foot. Does our five foot <coughs> requirement apply to not the for site. private interior walks, they don't. Does, okay. I guess, I guess I would recommend it, but if our ordinance doesn't require it. And then the other thing is, does their private sidewalks connect to city sidewalks? Does it go out to Middle Road or does it go to Happy Joe so that people can walk over to Wendy's or walk over to Hungry Hobo or, right, they, or they, they have, to get in their, have to get in their car and drive to Hungry Hobo? Yeah, they could they could walk through the property, but they don't have a, a right of way for us to require a sidewalk to be placed on. Yeah, because that was an existing driveway. You know, so that was the Northwest Bank driveway, and they never made any amendments to that or changes. Everything was north of them, just access through there. Hey, Your Honor. Yes, Lisa. I know that property. The difficulty with it was always that it was landlocked and I don't because the maps up. I don't remember how much more can be developed, but it seems silly. And then tying in with Bill's question, it seems silly that we've always, um, you know, we're running traffic through the bank. We're running traffic now through Happy Joe's Drive. Is there some point at which we're going to need to inquire, maybe acquire some property and create a city street that will solve this uh I don't know, it just seems silly we're running traffic through a bank and through all these strange locations. Um, and I don't even know if there's an answer. It's an answer for down the road, but um, maybe that's something we need to look at if it's even possible because it's landlocked. It might not be something that's possible. Does that make sense? I think your question and thought does make sense. I think there'll be a, I mean, is that something we want to do on private property if this is how they want to develop it and we it's our standards and ordinances? Your Honor, we looked at that during the initial Ewing and it was, could we push a city street out to the north to tie into Tech Drive and you have to build a bridge there at that point to cross it, which obviously is not feasible for a secondary access when they were able to obtain a private access easement. Okay. Yes, Chief. I, the thing is, I just, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, there is not an issue currently going on with the current situation. Uh, I don't believe we've got any issues no. up there the way it is now at all. So I just, I mean, I just want to be clear. Because and we are about to go live in a couple of days with the new traffic signal at Middle and 29th. And, and you all remember, we've talked about the ability because we did not have 
a traffic control device between AAA Court and Spruce Hills. There was no gapping there. And that's why that left is so hard to get out. It's incredibly busy through there. We'll be able to control those gaps and hopefully provide some, some safer uh, left turns out of there once that signal goes live. Okay. Keep okay and I've got another question then. Can you give me an example <clears throat> in the city of another area we've got uh, private access from a development? Brett was just referring to. Is there another area where we're going through a for private the access the, development? The, from the villas, the villas Cumberland. off of Devil's Glen yeah, the is Square. totally uh, through private streets. Uh, throughout okay. The, the exit by well. the you exit by Coffee Hound. You exit by um, out to Middle Road through a private drive uh, that okay. ultimately connects you to a city street by Fairway. Um, yeah. All the Cumberland, all the back side of Cumberland Square go through a parking lot. Um, all of the whole back of Cumberland Square is all private, private roads. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I was just trying to thank you. All right. Other questions. All right. I'd like to entertain a motion that consent agenda M remain on tomorrow night's consent agenda. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? We'll take up consent agenda M tomorrow. If you want to move over to consent N as in Nancy for us, please, Mark. Sure. This is um, 6500 block of Valley Drive. This applicant is Scott Pierce with Blue Water Group. Uh, I believe they make spas, um, tubs, those type of things for uh, home use. Uh, this is a preliminary plat. Um, current use off of Valley Drive is ag. Um, proposed uses are... Four lots, three developable, and one out lot for stormwater. Uh, it'll be industrial uh, manufacturing for the spa use, um, spa facility. The Bobby Small Office is located with that as well, and then some storage, a storage component. And then uh, another lot that will be um, probably build to suit, if you will. Just some future land use map and zoning map here. So we have industrial on both. Um, these are all industrial uses, and so they do comply. A lot of floodplains. So everything you see in blue is a floodplain. So all but the very middle of the site are actually in the floodplain. Uh, they will have to meet our floodplain, our model floodplain ordinance will require two feet above, um, which they should be able to do on the site. Um, we are gonna have them get a, a clomer from FEMA, basically a comment letter from FEMA just to uh, make sure FEMA weighs in on this, but we don't see any problem from a floodplain development perspective as long as they do meet our, uh, our code. Uh, preliminary plat, um, again, three lots uh, for development, one for out lot. Uh, there will be dedication of right-of-way for a street. Um, future plan is maybe someday the street would connect all the way through, so you'd have a north-south-ish connection between Valley Drive and uh, Highway 67. <clears throat> and here's a, a very general and, and honestly changing concept plan. So. Uh, the Blue Water Group would locate their office headquarters and manufacturing facility here. This would be a uh, future development for another industrial user. And then probably just one set uh, in the near term, if you will, of uh, contractor condos. They'll probably be expanding um, this area for a, a little bit larger um, stormwater area. So this, this portion of the lot probably won't uh, have quite as many contractor condos, if any, on it at all. But again, we're just looking at the preliminary plat today, so that site development plan will be coming to you at a future date when we have a final plat. Uh, again, just some basic elevation concepts here for the contractor condos. We did have a positive staff recommendation and a positive planning and zoning commission. Of course, floodplain development permits are required. We're also requiring the Colmer from FEMA um, and access easements must be shown for lot three. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Questions? Bill and Greg. So I know that uh, there may be a proposed street that will eventually contact, uh, connect to State Street, but <clears throat> How staff feel about all this industrial traffic exiting onto Valley Drive alone? 
Yeah, we already have a lot with the trucking company or Republic company there. Um, so that use does exist. Valley Drive in that area has been zoned industrial for a long time. It's now kind of started to turn. As far as tra total traffic counts, I don't know. It does, it does put a lot of pressure on the old highway or Valley Drive. It does, but unfortunately, they would be landlocked if we didn't give them access to Valley Drive. That is the only, because they were not able to acquire the other two pieces to the yeah. south. So, so what, what's your opinion of dumping more industrial traffic onto Valley Drive? It, definitely not ideal. There's no doubt about it. We need that second connection to help relieve some of that. So that's, I think, kind of the trade-off here is they're hopefully path. they're able, their plans would be to acquire the other two pieces. They're trying to work with the other, uh, the piece to the immediate south is another family member, and then the third piece is going to be a little more difficult. But, um, you know, kind of similar to what we've done with Criswell, trying to at least secure the right-of-way and get anything that we can get built for the future. It's not ideal, but I guess. Well, I think the... Uh, to Bill's point, I mean, I think we always thought there ought to be a second connection. Whether this is the right location is to be determined, but this is an opportunity for us to try to set that up um, for that ultimate connection. And and we think we might be able to get that. We we do have the opportunity at Criswell. We have that pretty well, um, well that right, away. right away set up for that. And we always thought there should be one here. Whether this is the perfect location, I think that's debatable. And it, it does have the byproduct that you mentioned, Bill, but I don't know that um, you'll get significant <clears throat> in, in, you know, heavy industrial use just with that one as far west as it is. But we think the opportunity to obtain it is a, is a bright move for the future. Might not be the, exactly the way we want it, but it's better than not having it, I think, is the way we think about it. I could be mistaken, Mark, but I don't think they actually manufacture. Uh, I think they're just a distributor of fiberglass pools, so I think that should help as well. Um, that you're not actually going to be having raw materials coming and going from the site. I think it's just a storage warehouse and then office for them. Yeah. Contract, it'll be trucks for the contractor condos, not semi trucks, but probably, you know, F-250s, F-350s with trailers. Correct. I had the same problem. Oh. So wow. great minds work alike. <laughs> Lisa, do you have anything on this one? Can't you, can't nope. you, um, nope. can't you uh, at some point when we get this road through, can't we restrict <clears throat> traffic with an ordinance uh, on Valley to, at a certain weight? We might you, be able to do that. You, you could load limit. You could load limit. We're, you know, we're talking about that right now with, as, as we're, as we're working our way through Criswell, um, that you would load limit Criswell and push that um, those trucks up on on Crow Creek um, because that's a fully drainable based 12 inch street until we get Criswell to a place to be built like that. So you could load limit this. That might be a way to to do that. Yeah, that's just not not a good spot for. But clearly, this would be to our advantage long term for vehicular traffic, more pedestrian. I mean, more. Um, cars and, and buses and vans um, to be able to go between Valley and, and um, US 67. But but that is the short short term problem with this. Okay. Yep. Back to Bill. How is the concrete overlay holding up? Here, here. Um, it seems like in the last 18 months or so, we've had a few blow ups that we've had to patch. Um, whether we're going to get another 15, 20 years out of it, that's probably debatable. Um, but I, I don't know what the original lifespan, I'd have to dig out and see what, um, I know it varied quite a bit in thickness. So I think those thinner areas are probably the ones that we're seeing starting to have some blow ups. It's a lot of uh, use with concrete trucks, doesn't it? Yes. yes. Unfortunately. Yep. The blow ups that we have had, we've just, we, I've had my staff go in and do full depth eight, nine inch thick concrete patches in those sections, just okay. in those blow up areas. And they just seem to be areas where they were, uh, had a lot of groundwater underneath that pavement because it doesn't have a drainable base. That's probably 15 years old, Bill. Oh, the white topping? Yeah, yes. I think you're probably in that range. Yep. Yeah. And I think it was 15 to 20 when it was, <clears throat> when it and was then, laid and, down. And asphalt, 
overlay is 20 that you hope to get, you know, being concrete, maybe 25 at the most probably since it wasn't as thick. Yep. Thank you. Any other questions here on N? <laughs> and I'd like to entertain a motion that it, re it remain on consent for tomorrow night. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any Aye. opposed? We'll take it up tomorrow. Let's go to our last one for you, Mark. Oh. <laughs> 3403 Overland Drive. This is just an update. Really, um, we just have a contract for your approval for demolition of this property. Uh, it is not a city-owned property. This is a private residence that's been abandoned uh, for some time now. Um, and we spent a lot of time uh, talking to you about uh, different things in, um, in three-on-three sessions, and we just did some uh, an ordinance change. So I just kind of want to give you some perspective on what we did here. So here's a little timeline. Uh, you'll see some pictures of, of the property in question. Uh, we get a lot of calls on it. I think you all get a lot of calls on it. Uh, hopefully this activity uh, will cease uh, with, with the um, demolition. So this property, um, we were able to get a search warrant to enter the property on July 9th of 2021. We were assisted by um, Bettendorf PD, Bettendorf Fire Department to actually access the property. You'll see it's uh, quite, a, quite a mess. Uh, we've got a bad roof, we've got animal infestation, that's why things are all strewn about. And then you also have an abandoned pool in the backyard causing some concern for neighborhood children and whatnot. Uh, we did get a demo agreement and provided to the owner on June uh, 28th of 2022. They declined our initial agreement. Uh, that led to uh, some help from city councilor Chris Curran. On October 4th, 2022, we approved the use of Iowa Statute 67A to pursue this case. That lets us bring these cases directly to district court, so we don't have to go to magistrate court. Uh, Chris did a ton of work to get that ordinance drafted. Um, it gave our previous demo agreement a lot of teeth because now we had something to say, if you don't take our agreement, we have a way to pursue you <clears throat> in district court uh, rather quickly as opposed to going through magistrate court and all, all the hoops that we have to jump through there. Um, 13 days later, the owner, uh, after we passed our, our 67A um, ordinance, the owner signed the demo agreement. So I think that things, those two things are related, and I really appreciate council support in doing that. Also, I can't say enough how much uh, Chris Curran, Rex Ridenour, our um, staff uh, in code enforcement did to get us to this point. So really, the contract is just a chance for me to give you an update. Um, we did sole source the contract because we were able to, to piggyback on our um, flood buyout demo. Uh, so we bid that, and then this came in just a few days later, and we were able to just uh, piggyback on that. So it is a sole source, but we do have a current bid, and it's within a very reasonable cost, I'll be honest with you. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions, Greg? Comment. Uh, I've got a I do. 100 calls on this thing. And I want to thank you and your staff and the city attorney and everybody for their Much work on this thank because you. it this needed to go. It was there's two little children live next door and safety issue. So thank you all. Thanks, yeah. My secretary. Glad to have one next door. Lisa, go ahead. Okay, we're paying for the demolition, right? We are. And then okay, and then this property is remaining in his hands. It will, but we'll have a lien and we'll be made whole upon sale of the property. Thanks for allowing me to clarify that. I should have said that earlier. Okay, so then we'll be reimbursed for the demo. Yes. Yeah, once the property sells. <laughs> okay, all right. That lien would be satisfied. See, I was gonna say, he's set up to, uh, it's property's cleared and he can rebuild a new house and we did him a great service. So, um, just down the road if he sells it. Okay. So that's, existing. That's Existing liens of several thousand dollars already just for the mowing and shoveling that we've had to do of the sidewalk. This just looks like it needs a little elbow grease, eh? You <laughs> <laughs> need C four. Looks like <laughs> looks like your apartment in college, John. Yeah, that's what I was telling you. <laughs> Except a mole. <laughs> that looks like a heck of a Friday night. Uh, <laughs> Other questions, you, Your Honor. Thoughts? Mark Mark is being modest. He has been. Uh, uh, I think he started the presentation patting himself on the back for well, using the colors. He's been <laughs> using, uh, he has been zealously in pursuit of this uh, property, and he's engaged all of us, and, and uh, he's done a great job uh, to get us to this point. And 
lots of people helped, but Mark's been the uh, the driving force, and we're I'm hoping that uh, when you approve this tomorrow, that we might have somebody there with a backhoe on Wednesday. It could be done. <laughs> Well, the good news is there's a few more out there now that whatever you've learned from this procedure, you can go to the next one. <laughs> Actually, I, think, I think, Mayor, that, that really is a good point. Uh, all jokes aside, that we um, were able to use city attorney's expertise to identify the state statute. But now we have a playbook. Um, we, I think we will use this judiciously. This is not something we want to do very often, but there are a few cases that I think it, it is appropriate, and now we know the steps to do that, and we can pursue those. Perfect. Just keep our first string quarterbacks playing. We've got a lot of bad things going on. Jerry and then Frank. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I, I, I would like to also say thank you very much. You know, this isn't my award, but uh, I think this is a good precedent. And, and uh, it shows that our code enforcement people are doing a good job. I do have a question about the demolition here. The demolition will not demolish the sidewalk, correct? The sidewalk, no, the side, will, yeah, the sidewalk will reta uh, be retained. Right. And no. then, of course, we will have the problem with snow removal on this. Yes, it. yeah. And, and, <clears throat> and mowing the whole yard right. uh, after it's done because he probably won't mow it. I think they're going to demo the sidewalks too, Jerry. Well, that's about it. <laughs> I don't, I don't want the grass. sidewalk demo. So, all jokes aside, <laughs> we may have to cut the sidewalk to cap, to cap some utilities. They'll come back in warm weather. And put appropriate and, sidewalk back in it, if yeah. they have to do that. Because but. it because it is a neighborhood, and and you know you it, it is in a neighborhood, and the expectation is that the neighborhood kids you know ride their bike up and down it. That the for sure we'll neighbors push and and we will that. continue to if we are responsible because he doesn't take care of it, we'll continue to do it. We'll continue to lean the property into the point when we talked earlier with Lisa's question. Uh, whoever buys this property ultimately is going to have to pay all those liens for the sale. So um, the sooner this thing gets demolished, the better off uh, he is to try to sell it because he's not going to sell it in this condition. So hopefully yep. somebody responsible buys it and we don't have any more issues here. And to Greg's point, the neighbors want this down. They'll be okay if the sidewalk goes away for a couple of months. <clears throat> Thank Frank. you. Thank you, Your Honor. Mark, just before we leave this, since we're talking about this, could you give us an update on how successful we've been with the Maple Crest property, is this contractor working now? Is this going to take care of the problem, or is he going to be in there for a short period of time and then back out like they have in the past? It's a very skilled contractor. I, they're capable of doing the work. Um, you know, they're going to want payment to do it. So, I, I would assume as long as they're getting paid, they'll continue to do the work. Um, yeah, different property we're talking about here in different part of town, but um, actually not that far away. Um, Pretty close. But yeah, the restoration company that's working there is, is very qualified to do the work, um, and they're under contract to do it. They've pulled all the appropriate <coughs> permits. They're they're you know straight shooters. We don't expect any problems. I think the roof is going on as we speak. It was mm -hmm. good. Good job, sir. Thank you. Any other <coughs> questions? All right, nice job, team. We appreciate you. Let's uh, keep a <coughs> agenda O on consent tomorrow night by vote, please. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> All right, we'll take it up on consent. Uh, let's take a look at the rest of the consent agenda before we get into the rest of our business this evening, and then we'll go to your presentation on um, the other two items. Anything else on consent that any particular council person would like to address at this time? I have a question. What is a Metrom Tactic ID hyphen N plus handheld spectrum spectrometer? That'd be me, sir. <laughs> <laughs> does, that, does that make me look stupid? But I don't know what a spectrometer is. It does worry me about trips to you know the hospital for certain procedures, but oh, well, it's in, it's in uh, your chief, it's, it's your, mine. Oh yeah. my god! All right, this is good. Tell me about this. You're not gonna like this, Your Honor. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll. One of the issues is with the amount of drugs and narcotics that our officers are dealing with on the streets uh, and with fentanyl, as, as you know, just exposure to some of these substances can be very dangerous. Uh, Lieutenant uh, Andrew Champion uh, wrote a grant for the SCRA, which we, we did receive to pay for this. Uh, and what this uh, device is, is it's something that all our officers can use when we bring in narcotics where we don't have to be taking things out of packages uh, taking samples, exposing ourselves to danger, 
and actually it's uh, something that can be used with packages that aren't opened uh, to be able to not only uh, identify what the substances are, but be able to do it in a safe manner. So this is, uh, this is a great piece uh, of uh, technology that we want to utilize to keep our officers safe, and it also will be able to more accurately identify the substances we're dealing with for court purposes. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty neat. Uh, from the time he uh, asked for the grant, he did a little bit of negotiating, and uh, boy, when you know, they came down in price a little bit. So the original grant, I believe, was for about 33000 and and the final cost for this is, uh, there's two main devices out there, and we like this one, so I believe it's like 26000 26712 in our package. Oh, so that's what the, our request is. And the, the grant yeah, is, the grant is for that amount, right? Right? Yeah, and the, grant, and the grant is actually for more than that, so it's going to be 100% covered by the grant. It won't be any cost to the city, and it's going to be a really uh, nice tool for our officers to have. Fantastic. Any other questions on any other consent item? Yes, Frank. Jerry. I'm sorry, Jerry. Oh, thank you, Your Honor. I uh, saw your hand. I looked over. I said, Frank, that's on me. That's okay. Uh, item G, I noticed that we are not requiring uh, any st stormwater changes up there. Uh, at the same time, they uh, paved a whole section of... Of, uh, of uh, lawn out there, and now we have impervious surface. Yeah. And I, and doesn't all this drain across into the golf course? Or it does. No, there, there's already stormwater detention that was built with the dentist's office to cover both lots. Oh, okay, so there is. Yeah, it's actually north of there, just south of the creek. So you can't see it from the road, but it is there. There's a second pond. Ah, okay, thank you. Anything else on consent? All right, then I'd entertain a motion to re uh, allow all items on consent to remain there for tomorrow night. Moved. <coughs> Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? We'll take up all consent agenda items as written. Presentations will continue. Boy, we're learning a lot tonight. <laughs> Thank you, Aaron. You're um, welcome. You have a memo from myself and Chris, mostly Chris, so. Um, on the Webster line. vacancy? Correct. All right. Um, because Alderman Scott Webster has submitted his resignation because of his new position with the Iowa State Senate, we have a vacancy uh, that will be effective on December 31st. And we need to make a decision of how to fill that vacancy. Your choices are by appointment or by special election. Um, Chris can go through um, both of the options with you. Um, then we expected some discussion of how you wish to proceed. Um, and if we can come to a conclusion this evening uh, to give us direction, uh, we've outlined what we think are the timelines under which uh, that would occur. Um, if that uh, decision doesn't want to be directed to us tomorrow night, we think we should make that for sure at the next meeting. Um, if we uh, choose to um, fill that vacancy as soon as possible, we've added... Um, uh, the opportunity for tomorrow's agenda to make that happen. Um, but we're trying to, I think, um, take applications that would be accepted through January 6th. Um, if you do this by appointment, uh, we would then deliver them for your review. Uh, we'd make presentations at the meeting January 16th, and then we would suggest a special meeting be called the week of January 23rd, likely the 24th, just based on our internal calendars for you to decide on the final appointment. But if you choose uh, to call for a special election, uh, that calls for such election to take place as soon as possible. And in our conversations with the auditor, she says that most likely that would take place on March 7th, um, and a special election would cost us between eight and $10,000. This, pos this position would be up for election again in November. We can lean Scott's money from the state to pay for that, right? <laughs> Uh, I just see now you got a break in the action. You got to sorry, go back sorry, Your Honor. Sorry, I was I was a little slower in, than usual. I think I caught Jerry's call. Um, <laughs> uh. So with that, um, maybe Chris wants to jump in and and fill in any holes that I missed. Um, I think you got the 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 main points. I think the one 
<clears throat> the one thing I'd just like to clarify, it's, it's obviously in the memo, I tried to make it pretty specific, but <clears throat> of the two choices, if you do go with the, the, if you do decide to go for an appointment, there is the possibility that a special election would be required anyway. Um, if we get 15% of uh, valid signatures, so people that live in the fifth ward, 15% um, of the last, um, the, the number of voters from the last time the fifth ward was up. So we would need 61 valid signatures from that ward. And if that takes place, um, then there would be a special election anyway. There are certain timing issues um, in terms of when that would take place and would be dependent upon when the appointment was made or when the notice of intent to appoint is made. So that date, we don't know at this point, but that there is that possibility. So I just wanted to make that clear that an election may take place even if you decide to go the appointment route. So, And we have historically, Your Honor, done both. Yeah. So there's no even during my time. right or wrong answer here. It's just uh, the council's decision and the council's uh, vote to... To proceed. My only concern is the time frame between when you think you would request that the potential applicants return their packets on <coughs> January 6th and a decision time. Uh, in the past, the council was involved in doing some interviews of some uh, attractive candidates. I don't know that we'll get that done in the 10 day period unless we all block off some time mm -hmm. now. It's possible to do maybe some subset of the city council that might do that. Um, and then we appoint people to, to, to go and then come back and, and provide you input. That that would be fine. I just I worry about that. What's that from the 6th to the 16th? It's pretty tight. And I would say, Your Honor, the the issue of, of how to make the appointment is is really up to, to the council. There, there's no there's nothing in the state code that that specifies or dictates the type of process. We, we there was the process in the past, as I understand it, where there would be sort of a give and take interview. Yeah, we may um, want to tweak some and, of that. And so what we had put in the the um, as one of the potential actions for tonight is to to really have an opportunity for the potential appointees to provide an, a statement, but not really a question and answer in, at a special session, but and then to have the actual decision made at a subsequent meeting. But, but again, it's it's up to the council if you go that route on how to structure it. And, and I'm partially to blame for um, the timetable that we set out. I thought if we were going to do an appointment, it would be advantageous to have someone on board as we start the budget process, um, and we would be... Uh, giving our budget presentation uh, likely on Monday, February 6th, I think, is if I remember my calendar right, Jason, and our main work session on February 11th. Otherwise, if, and I'm not, there's no right or wrong, um, if that's not anything the council is concerned about, um, the, you know, the dates to, the, to your point are really to what Chris said, to your choosing as to how you want this to occur. I think really for tonight, you're you're trying to have a discussion about the concept of appointment versus correct having a, a, an election. That's correct. Okay. Anybody want to weigh in on that? I'll start with Greg, and maybe we'll just go all the way through. Greg, what are your thoughts? Thank you, Your Honor. Well, I <clears throat> my 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 political leanings are election because it's it's fifth wards representative and they should have a voice in it but then I'm I'm also uh, we're all responsible for the uh, fiscal well well-being of the of the city as well and it's eight or ten thousand dollars and then they're gonna have to run again in just a few months anyway November, so I'm kind right? I'm kind of torn but <clears throat> I, I think I'm leaning more toward uh, an appointment <coughs> because the the people in fifth ward can still Get 61 signatures and and still have a and still have an election if that's what they choose. If if they're okay with us making an appointment for a few months and then having an election, then that's that's fine too. Okay. So I think right now to save the money and there's a, a way for them to 
to override that decision, and I, I, I'm comfortable with that. That's that's kind of where I sit tonight. Thank you, sir. Scott? Thank you, Your Honor. I, I agree with Greg that I, if, if we thought that the voice of the people would truly be heard, like, are they interested in, would they show up? Because historically, with special elections, I think with, with Bill's election in the morning, it was like 1.6% of eligible voters showed up, and maybe in the afternoon, as much as 3 to 4% for a total of maybe 5%. That's not a large number of people. We don't, I don't think, have a strong bench in the city of Bettendorf of people that are willing to step up and serve in city government. And sadly, I think Bill had to raise nearly $4,000 to run and was maybe motivated to run. But I don't, I'm not confident that we've got people out there that would step up and serve, let alone try to fundraise and get a competent campaign put together on this short notice. So no disrespect to the financial argument, I think what, in the big picture here, what we need is people that are willing to serve in local government. How do we encourage people to get involved? And obviously, mm -hmm. we're talking about the difference between 11 months and nine months of service, and that yeah. the voice of the people would be heard more likely when you're up for election. We've got some other folks that are running where they would actually have a more authentic voice. So I think we ought to turn our sights on to how we encourage people to get involved on our boards and commissions and to see themselves as the type of person that would serve on city council. And if we get six or eight applications or, you know, throw the number out, I don't, I don't know that it matters, but if we can't, if we don't have a clear, Keep going, I'm if sorry. we don't have, if we don't have a clear winner, a clear candidate that we think uh, would be a great representative to the city council, we can always go to a, an election and pivot to that. And I think with, with Bill's case, with Don Wells and Luton, and I can't remember the other gentleman's name, Franks or something like that, Perhaps. Franz, um, it wasn't clear. I mean, <laughs> that, that would have been some hard feelings, I think. So for my seat, I'd like to recruit people to put their hat in the ring and see what we can do, and presumably through the course of interviewing, um, do an appointment. Okay. Lisa, we're gonna go to you since Scott's sitting in your seat. <laughs> I agree absolutely with Scott. So um, he said, said it all. Bill. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, when Scott Webster initially ran for Fifth Ward Alderman, he worked hard, he went door to door, he talked to people, he listened to their concerns. And uh, it got him elected. Uh, I really think the people of the Fifth Ward, the residents of the Fifth Ward, should pick who should be the representative. It's, I think that's, that's the way it's initially set up. Uh, you know, maybe a lot of people didn't vote when I first ran, but it's almost a tradition anymore that in Bettendorf, if you are a seated council member, a lot of us run unopposed. So I don't think you're going to see uh, if we appoint somebody that there's going to be a great interest in wanting to do something else in November. So I, I vote for the voice of the people. Thank you, sir. Jerry. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. I, I guess my concern is that for uh, a new board member, a new council member, uh, to be very effective, uh, they need to be on board for the budget process. And while I agree with the concept of the voters having an input, we are not totally locking them out, if, if there are a significant number of voters that have concern, we're going to have this on the council agenda uh, in, the, you know, in the next couple of weeks, they can show up. And, and uh, therefore, I guess I would like to say that my initial uh, assessment is go for an appointment. And like Scott said, we can always go to plan B and go to an election if that doesn't work out. 
Thank you, sir. Frank. Thank you, Ryder. Uh, I'm in support of an appointment, and I, I think one of the biggest reasons is I'm one that was appointed when I originally came on the park board and then ran for council. Uh, this person that's going, if they're appointed, is going to be a short-term situation, and then they're going to have to run again. So they're going to have to run two times. And when you were talking about the dollars and cents, Scott, uh, I think that's a lot to ask of any individual personally. So I would support the uh, the appointment, and uh, that's it. Thank you, sir. Your Honor, can I add something? You may. I know I had this guy covered it. Um, Frank's got a good point as far as, you know, the money part. I mean, it costs a lot to run, but, you know, people that are going to put in for an appointment, they're looking at this seriously. They're looking at their time and stuff. So, um, you know, they're looking at this seriously. I know Bill made the comment of a lot of times we don't have an op have oppo opponents, but I think there's a general consensus of people in Bentonville who are happy with the government. You see how many don't show up for our meetings. So, I mean, I think there's a reason for that, but I think the people that are gonna put in for the uh, appointment have seriously thought about this. So I don't think that's gonna be a bad thing. And then to Greg and everybody else's po a point, um, if they aren't happy, you know, they can go get that petition for a special election. So just wanted to add that. So are we comfortable putting on tomorrow night's agenda a vote on this issue? Are there questions that you have that you would rather have answered tonight? <clears throat> so it sounds like we'd like to have a resolution directing staff to publish notice of the council vacancy and request applications and resumes for potential appointment, understanding that may not be voted on positively tomorrow night and anybody could make the um, motion or resolution to uh, fill the vacancy by a special election. So if that goes down tomorrow night, obviously we're doing a special election. Do we have anybody have an issue with putting it on tomorrow night's agenda? You need more time to, you can all talk to each other obviously and ask any questions of Chris. I'd make that motion, Your Honor, if you're entertaining it. Yes, please. Second. All right, there's a motion and a second to uh, direct staff to put on tomorrow night's agenda, the request that we publish notice for a council vacancy and request for applications for resumes for potential appointments. Is there any discussion on this item? Bob, can I add, add another thing? I know sure. I keep piping in. I know when I did my uh, questionnaire, there was a question as far as um, would I be would I be willing to run or am I planning on running or something because it was going to be a short term appointment? I think that's something that needs to be included um, because that's something critical as far as you know, are they applying because it's an appointment and it's a easy thing versus running? You know, so that that's a question, just to FYI, Decker, to put that in on the questionnaire. So Perfect. Any more, any more um, advice for what we should be doing? We can certainly do. We can do that tomorrow night. We can yeah. uh, get through the vote and see what happens. All those in favor of directing staff to do that, uh, add it to tomorrow night's agenda in the way I've described, signify by aye. 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 Any opposed? I will right, we'll take it up tomorrow. Bill. Oh, Bill, Bill's, Bill's a nay. Somebody's going to win the election six to one, it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> Your Honor, this, this isn't locking us into the procedure for appointment because I don't, I don't really agree with the subcommittee. No, no there's no. no procedure. This is just, a, and if... I'm just trying to find ways to, to no, better what we did last time. I understand. I understand. But we'll take that input. Let's see what happens tomorrow night, and then let's figure out how we're going to do it. We'll have, until we get the resumes back, to know what even step two might be. We're going to ask for the resumes, and we're going to put together a questionnaire. So if you have information on questionnaires, that we could do first. We, we will examine, Your Honor, questions and, and field some questions to you and take questions or, or suggestions. Um, of interview type questions, so um, this just this just starts the process and um, makes us publish the notice. Okay, we have been at it for an hour and a half. Let's take a ten minute break. Ten minute be great. Ten minute break and allow our folks to talk to get ready to talk about the CIP. There is some food if you're interested. Thank you. We took a ten minute break, grabbed a little something to eat, hit the restrooms, and we're back for our CIP review. And for this, we welcome our 
City Administrator Decker Plain, Finance Director Jason Shatt, Public Works Director Brian Schmidt, Community Development Director Mark Hunt, and the rest of you who all put in your uh, requests. And, and Your Honor, um, Brent Morlock, our city engineer, is sitting at the table with Jason as he's kind of the major architect of... He's telling us how much it all costs. That's right. <laughs> um, so we gave you the CIP a um, week or so ago, maybe 10 days ago, in its draft form. It's still in, a, in its draft form, but we're hoping to take you through more of a global discussion and do not intend to go line by line through this uh, tonight. Um, I think we want to hit the what we think are the highlights. Um, we are um, a lot of projects are coming together in a perfect storm, particularly out at um, Forest Grove and Middle, relative to all of the development and the roundabouts and the Forest Grove um, improvements to the street system, um, sidewalks, trails, all of that sort of thing, which is a pretty uh, magnanimous undertaking um, and um, so we want to I think look at this from a strong macro level um, you can see that the the bonding issuance as proposed in 23 um, is pretty strong because all those things have come together uh, and Brent uh, and Jason will take you through that um, what I do want to point out to you is under this proposal and the movement of everything that's in place uh, the debt levy necessary to carry this would stay the same at $4.85. And you can see that the debt limit uh, relative to our debt margin still is falling pursuant the direction you gave us um, over the last four or five years. Um, and as I mentioned, I think in one of our discussions, um, when I first became city administrator 32 years ago, we were at roughly a 50% debt capacity or debt margin ratio. Um, and this gets us really close to that mark. And in the fifth year moves us um, down below that quite substantially. Um, and it, it would be almost impossible to try to do this with cash. You could not do it without bonding to keep all of these projects alive and do all the things that you want us to do. So. Um, we're going to go over it um, kind of by program, and um, I'm going to turn it over to Jason and to Brent, who've done the bulk of the work to get us here, and uh, then we'll take questions relative to any specific questions you might have on the individual projects in the in the program. So, Jason. Thank you, Decker. As you, you get there, Jason, you'll know my question will be, because <laughs> it's every year, because the debt limit portion used is going down but we also now are using sewer bonds, the SRF bonds, rather rel, uh, rather than a GO bond issuance, which of course doesn't count towards that. So you're still spending more money. Um, it just pulls it in a different way. So as you get to that part, help me through that again with what percentages you think it would be based on, thank you. No problem. Uh, how, much, how much was the over and under on that question? We knew it was coming, that's why I just, I, yeah, have, I, I, have, this, this I have a better answer uh, for you this year. So, uh, no, Decker, absolutely right. Uh, Brent and his team and, and all the folks on staff and I have probably bounced this CIP back and forth more than in any previous year as, as long as I've been in this seat. Uh, just in this environment of, of rising construction costs, uh, and now we'll couple that with rising interest costs. But um, I would just start off by saying that, as I say often, the CIP is, a, is very much a living document. Uh, the, the CIP plan you have in your hands um, is by no means final because things are constantly evolving in this world. Um, so the action that we'll be asking you to take over the next couple of council cycles relative to the bonds uh, is just that. It is relative to the bonds. It's not necessarily an approval of this line item CIP, which we'll, we'll talk in more detail about uh, throughout the budget process. Um, but you will begin with that those proceedings tomorrow night by just setting a public hearing on the issuance of, uh, and it reads up to 13.5 million. We only need 13 million in the project fund. Uh, at the advice of Bond Council, we always add a little bit of 
cushion to that number just in case the bonds would for some reason sell at a discount, which I have never seen most of our bonds sell at a premium. But in the case of a discount sale, we would need to borrow 13 and a half to get 13. Um, that's never happened, and we don't anticipate that to happen, but uh, at the advice of our bond council, um, we always add that cushion there just in case we would need that. So that said, on this uh, CIP summary page in front of you, uh, the first, I would say, three quarters of rows are, are very much just a summary of the line item CIP, which makes up the bulk of the packet uh, behind this page. Um, so you can see it's kind of broken down by program as we move down the page, and then all five years, uh, really six years of, of uh, fiscal year work uh, is shown here. Um, and as Decker said, this is very much front loaded because of all of the projects happening out at Forest Grove and Middle uh, and a few other big projects throughout town. Uh, so you see the, the actual expenditures here in FY23 at 18.2 million, uh, almost 13 million in FY24, but we're easing that back uh, 11 and a half in 25 down to 8.8 .8 in 26. And an increase in the sidewalk and in the alley and in the patching programs for this year as well. And that's we always talk about hey, do we just put these placeholders there for a reason or do we actually need it? Is this the year where instead of 18.6, you pull that million and a half out? And we what wait you're till seeing next? there in, in <laughs> FY23 <laughs> is um, delays from 22 that we've carried forward. Um, so while we're and we're bonding for 13 million, we're spending 18. So about five million dollars worth of projects is um, delayed from last year, just hadn't taken place. So now we got to amend the budget in the new year, <coughs> FY23, because we're and I say this often, it, we kind of shoehorn a construction year budget into two fiscal years. So right. it does it's there's not always a clean break at June 30th. Um, so that's the effect is we've, we've carried over some, some costs from last year to the new year. Um, to answer your question, Your Honor, there, there are gonna be a few programs that, that we are gonna be able to phase out. Um, I think specifically within the, the five year, the alley program for one, um, if construction costs had not increased the way they had, we were projecting to be done with all of our asphalt alleys in year three. We're gonna most likely push out to year five, maybe year six, depending on what kind of inflationary numbers we continue to see, but then that <coughs> line item drops completely off. <clears throat> then we have that discussion of, do we move that money to your local streets? Are, are we spending enough? Or are we not spending enough? And you know, I think um, we just got brand new pavement management data. Uh, took a while to get back from the state, um, but they were, streets were driven in late 21. They, they processed that for months. Uh, and actually with our new GIS specialist that's come on board here in the last couple of weeks. Um, I would expect during the budget presentation that we'll be giving you a, an update on the condition of our streets and how that is relative to what those silos are showing. Do we continue to show a million here, a million here, 500 here, or do we need to reduce or change uh, what that ratio is? Okay. Thank you. On the... Uh bottom quarter of the page in front of you with the colored rows I want to just kind of touch on um, quickly. You see there the first gold bar, yellow bar, uh, the geo bond issue necessary to support the projects above. Uh, and, we, and we talked about the 13 million this year. Uh, we think 11 million will do it next year, 10 million the following, and then eight and a half million going forward. So you see the average of those six issuances is just under 10 million. Um, which is kind of a, a good target, I think, where we like to be. Uh, the blue row, sewer SRF issue. So this is a new maneuver for us. Uh, Your Honor, you pointed out the use of revenue bonds in the sewer fund, and we actually got away from that last year and sold GO bonds in the sewer fund. Um, SRF is uh, actually even a little bit more advantageous to us. It's the state revolving fund loan. Uh, so right now, the interest rate there is 2% over 20 years uh -huh. uh, with a quarter percent annual fee. That is considered geo debt. So it's it's included it's in, in that okay. debt limit. But it's also at a rate that you want to take advantage of. Yes. Right. Absolutely. So put everything in that bucket. Yep. As exactly. much as you can. So Brent and I actually have a meeting with uh, our friends at McClure later <clears throat> this week. Uh, they're going to help us work through that first SRF loan. Um, 
Yeah, uh, everything starting with your project development, so your planning and design, your engineering fees basically, uh, are eligible for SRF. So we're gonna be pushing forward most likely next month with an initial planning and design loan to finish up uh, the engineering that's needed for the Spencer Creek lift station. Uh, we've had some changes in the, the landscape out there. Uh, we may have some alternatives that we want to look at. So there's a, a little bit of final engineering that needs to be done. That'll be our first test case of going through the SRF process. And I think uh, you notice there, those are some pretty large numbers in that blue row, uh, larger than what we've typically issued <clears throat> in the sewer fund. Um, but they should look familiar to you from the sewer rate study that we had completed last spring. Um, these are the, the issuances we need to complete Spencer Creek and to complete the I&I &I projects identified by McClure. We have flip-flopped uh, in the details you'll notice. Uh, when we had last spoken, we were gonna do I&I &I first and Spencer Creek in the latter half of the CIP. Uh, with the uh, development of uh, the I-80 interchange project going forward, uh, we flip-flopped those uh, to bring Spencer Creek uh, up to the earlier years and the I&I &I projects are now in the outer years um, just to take advantage of getting that work done at the same time that the interchange is done. Yeah, we're, we're also going to, if you'll remember for years, we've been talking about that little lift station that exists on the north side of 80 uh, and the force main that exists under as a way to serve something that if it came right here, we could handle that. Well, unfortunately, that force main, of course, falls directly in the abutment for the new interchange, so it has to be removed and we'd be laying out dead money to realign that down the off ramps and completely outside the footprint of the interchange. We thought it made a lot more sense at this point, especially with the rising construction costs. We need to get that pipe under 80 and get that station built. We, th we thought that there might be an opportunity with the DOT when they do the, the um, engineer, when they do the actual construction, um, that we might be able to get an open cut, but it doesn't appear that it's close enough yep. for us to get that. So. We'll still have to do a bore, um, but but we can go in probably under their uh, construction yeah. time frame. It might make it a little less. Um, yeah, especially if there are other utilities that may need to be relocated for other people as part of the project. Right. Are we confident that uh, that low SRF rate is going to continue, or do we think that the governor is going to change that? We have no indication that they're going to change it. It's been that way for the last, I think, 20 years yeah. uh, when the program okay. started. Uh, it's 1% for a 10-year loan, 2% for a 20-year loan, and it's been that way. And th I believe there are... There's 30-year loans for the treatment plans, but right. specific to that. Right. No indication that it's going to change. It's a huge success across the state, and it's very necessary, so I don't yep. expect it. It's actually a huge success across the country. Yeah. <clears throat> In the next row down, it's it's a white row, uh, stormwater geo issue. Here again, I, I think I would recommend we go the geo route. Um, no debt necessary in stormwater this year. I do think we'll need about $2.2 million next year just to keep up with the projects that we that keep kind of cropping up in that area, uh, but hopefully no more debt after that as the CIP is constructed today. If, if we add in <coughs> detention ponds and detention basins, or stabilization, stabilization that, that may, that may change, but, uh, as it's, as it's uh, planned today, um, <coughs> no further debt after next year would be needed there. And then I'll just reiterate what Decker had already pointed out. The orange row, uh, debt levy necessary 485. You'll remember we reduced this from $5 here in the current year's budget to 485. So one of the constraints that we tried to work with was keeping that debt levy, uh, the same, and then uh, the debt limit used, as, as Decker has already pointed out. Um, so we have constructed the CIP and, and really the debt plan around two constraints. The debt levy necessary, which we wanted to at least present to you at 485, and obviously you have the, uh, the authority to increase that if you would like. Um, and then secondly, the cash flow in the CIP fund which is and, on. And, and just by way, you always hear us talk about uh, what a nickel is worth in the operating levy and what a, a nickel is worth in the capital. So if in the capital side, you were to raise the levy a nickel, that's roughly a million dollars. On the operating side, it's roughly $100,000. Um, because you, there, 
it's a one-time deal in the issuance of the bonds, and in, in the operating levy, it's a continuous expenditure. So um, just want to make sure you get the distinction. Because I know somebody's going to say, wait a minute, you told us 100000 now you're telling us a million. On the debt side, it's worth a million. On the operating side, it's worth about 100000 Exactly right. Question. <clears throat> Back to the, uh, yeah. the uh, water. I'm sorry. Stormwater issues. Mm -hmm. We had, we, when we had those problems with Stafford Creek and losing the, in court and all that sort of stuff, we kind of our alternative was to try to do retention stuff. Mm -hmm. And is that is that is that where that's funded? There's a few projects, a few larger <coughs> ones. We're struggling to find extra detention on Stafford, unfortunately, because it's fully built out. Sure. Everything upstream. No, I'm just talking about the whole program. Is... Exactly. That would be built out of that program. Um, okay. So are, are, the is that Heights going project that we've talked about the basin for the property that we bought? Yeah. Haley Heights, White Post detention. Yeah. Um, and then the, any stream bank stabilization programs would be paid for out of that. But the, there are some but it, placeholders. But it's at, it's at zero, though. I mean, is that, Mike, I guess my question, is that going, that program going away? No, that is just no bond issuance. Okay. And that they're issuance. able to support both <laughs> operations and the projects just okay. through the fee. Thank you. Yeah. And actually, um, I should touch on, before we move on, um, Moving back to the sanitary sewer fee, um, we'll uh, propose another 4% increase for April of 23. We've been doing 4% for several years. Uh, then beginning in April 24, we would recommend um, instituting the findings from the rate study. And you'll remember those, uh, that called for increases of about 5.65%. Um, I don't know that it'll be 5.65% Every year, it might be 5.55 one year and 5.75 another, but right in that neighborhood. Um, and that that is to service these large debt issuances in that blue row. Um, like I said, those are larger than what we've done. But once we get past this Spencer Creek uh, project and past the I&I &I projects, I would anticipate we're probably back down to a normal, normal. sewer normal project level. In the stormwater, um, area, to your point, Alderman Adamson, uh, the projects are supported through the fee um, with uh, obviously much less debt issued. Um, but as planned, those fee increases could be decreased. We've been doing 20 cents annually for several years. I think there's an opportunity in the out years that that could drop to 10 cents, uh, 5 cents. And then I've, I've always kind of targeted that $6 per ERU as kind of a maybe a, a tipping point in that fund, and it, we're still on track to see that happen. If we were to get to six dollars, I think the fund sustains itself, as the CIP is constituted today. I'm always going to add that caveat. <laughs> <laughs> and for those of you with very long memories, when we started that program in the stormwater program, I recommended that we do five dollars per ERU. That was, I believe, twenty two years ago. I think somewhere in there. And the council didn't like that number and made it $2.50. So over those 20 years, we've gotten to the $5 rate and we're working our way now towards $6. I, want, I don't want to say I was a visionary, but I believe I was. Um, <laughs> had we done that then, um, we probably, I want to say we'd be retired with those issues, but we would have retired a lot of issues by then. Um, but, um, it's, it's a number that we recommended a long time ago, and we're just barely there now. So what's well, you have to hit a happy medium with what you recommend, what the public will accept. I, I understand. Right. Politically, exactly. I understand yeah. that, Bill. What's your new recommendation? <laughs> Work your way to $6. Oh, no. <laughs> Thank um, you for even asking the question. <laughs> So uh, before I leave this page, I'll just point out um, a few things in the, we have <coughs> quiet zones funded. Um, we have the arterial collector plan funded. Are we uh, going after that federal money for the quiet zones? Do we make application by de few separate December 1? No, we did not, Your Honor. Not, okay. not this year. 
uh, we weren't in a position to have a full report and approval. We did, actually, Decker came out and met with them. We had folks from <coughs> the FRA, uh, along with our consultant, that were down. That was a mandatory um, step in the checklist uh, to go and walk all the, the intersections or all the um, crossings and evaluate what they suggested versus what the FRA may see. And they were in full agreement with us. So now it's what is the, the next step is really the funding. And, how we and, there, and there, there are some other grant programs. There are right. plenty of, yeah, yeah we just need to. Yeah, the, the, the program that you saw that Davenport just applied for is not one that we were right. moving towards. So it'll be good to see what happens to them in that application. We were looking at more of the FRA grant, not, not the. USDOT, the consolidated. Yeah. So um, there's perfect opportunities here from in both ways. And from CP right. Foundation. And so um, the quiet zones, what we anticipated is if we were to get the, the $3 million allotment, we would be able to use that from a cash flow perspective. And st we would not be able to spend those dollars right away. And I think our numbers, if I'm correct, Brent, were like we, had, we estimated about $1.6 million, $1.7 million um, in actual construction of those six zones. Um, so we've spaced it out because there's no way we're going to be able to build all six at one time. And we've spaced it out over the CIP. We'd be able to use the three million up front if, it, if, the, um, if it's approved from a cash flow perspective for other things and balancing this in through the CIP. Okay. So, as I said, we have a couple of constraints while we're kind of planning the debt plan and, and, and building the CIP as a whole. Uh, one being that debt levy, and the second being the cash flow in the CIP fund to sustain the fund. Uh, and this gets back to kind of that shoehorning a construction year into a over a couple of fiscal years uh, theme. Um, if you look at the bottom of page two, this yellow row. This is the ending cash balance at June 30th in the CIP fund. Um, my goal here is to have that ending balance be about half of what I expect to spend in the next fiscal year because June 30th is smack in the middle of the construction season. So I know I've got a whole half a season to pay for uh, before we're going to issue bonds again. Um, so just to kind of, you know, pull back the curtain a little bit on how we come up with these debt and bond uh, numbers, bond issuance numbers. I'm shooting to have that that yellow column <clears throat> get me through half a year of, of construction is the idea. And then the other constraint being uh, the tax levy, the 485 uh, debt levy in our debt service fund. Um, this is an, al an analysis of that fund over the next uh, six years really, including this year. And you'll see the tax levy at 485 some very modest uh, increases in taxable value. Um, I tend to be conservative in my estimates of, of, of value because uh, I don't want to get us stuck yep. in these outer years. But you'll see the ending fund balance in the debt fund um, dips pretty heavily, but um, this is what this fund is for. It, it, it doesn't need to have a huge fund balance in it and begins to rebuild thereafter uh, the third or fourth year. Um, so those are the constraints that we had to work around. And then finally, this is the calculation of the debt margin. Um, and you can see in this last kind of tan brown row, um, those percentages moving from the 52% range uh, in the next couple of years down to 47 by the end of 27, 28, which we've summarized on the, on the first page. So with that, um, before I turn it over to Brent to really talk projects, um, in your packet, and you've seen this before, is the bond sale calendar here in blue. These are all of the actions that council will take. Um, I've included the Moody's rating call in there the week of uh, January 2nd, 2023, uh, just because I like to invite you to uh, attend that if you'd like. Um, I, it's kind of an interesting look at... at uh, the process. And then in the green is the budget calendar. I think it's it's all related, so I just wanted to share that again. Um, but I will go back to 
want to start here? I can, yeah, maybe we'll just go over from that initial summary, kind agree. of the, the high level programs. And then if you've got specific project info, I think you guys all you know, have been through this enough to understand how it's organized. Um, first section, main item, I-74. Uh, really our only remaining commitment. Uh, we've got a little bit of work left to finish on the current urban park, um, everything north of the railroad tracks. They've probably got that 75, 80, maybe 85% uh, with the weather that they've had complete. There's gonna be some plantings and landscape restoration that gets done early next year, but that's uh, fairly well along. Uh, the only other remaining portion there then obviously is the letdown structure. We don't do the letdown structure. What, what are some opportunities for that money? So this actually, the way it's crafted, does not have the letdown structure in there. So you will see that, that that's about a four to four and a half million dollar potential is yeah. what we're seeing. Um, so right now that is not showing it. So what, what we've established with the DOT, um, they generally speaking have a 10% threshold on their projects. If it comes in within 10% of their estimate, they award, they go. Um, so we had to talk to them knowing how significantly our costs have increased. Um, so basically we have the right to review all the, the bids uh, if it comes in over their estimate. Um, and then we'll have to bring that forward for you to consider. My gut says that number keeps rising. Uh, I think we're all fairly nervous about that. Um, I think they're targeting, originally it was a April letting. Um, I think they might have to move that back a month or two. They're I think running into some review issues. Uh, so we probably won't know that for still quite a while, unfortunately. They changed from January? Uh, so originally it was February and then it's kept creeping. April might actually be the current one. I would have to check with it back through the email. Okay. But it's been pushed a, a couple times. But but yes, as of right now, it is not shown in there. Um, if the number does come in good, what we've talked about is the, the DOT has been very receptive to extending our repayment. Uh, as of right now, as you can see on the screen, Jason has it, it finished in FY24. We would have to kick that out several years, um, two, three, maybe even four, who knows, depending on the number, um, to finish out that repayment. So we would be hopeful that they would be uh, amenable to that. As of right now, the agreement stands that we would pay everything off in FY25, any additional balance that hangs out there. So, you know, we'd be looking to push out for another couple of years. Still more to come on that one. So what's the million for? Uh, existing obligations. So we managed to pay ahead, and we've actually reduced what we've paid the last three years, I want to say, a little bit from what our agreement was. So we still have commitments for things and projects that they're closing out that we have to pay them back for. Uh, a good chunk of that is design of the letdown structure and then the urban park. All right, so it's not just letdown structure. It's not just letdown right. structure. I think we had about 675,000, 700,000 uh, worth of costs for the current section of the urban park, so we're paying for that as well. All right. Thanks. Um, quiet zones, I think we've, we've touched on. If nobody has any questions there. Um, bridge program, this is just our routine bridge maintenance. Um, you know, we completed the Indiana Bridge uh, over Spencer Creek last year. That was a big one. Our two probably worst bridges left in town right now are Middle Road over Duck Creek and 18th Street over Duck Creek, uh, both of which are going to be a nightmare to <laughs> rebuild, quite frankly, with all the traffic and, and detours. Um, they're working their way up. Uh, there's a standardized rating system. Uh, once you hit a certain threshold in that, you're eligible for funding through the state. They have a, what's called a city bridge program. Um, that caps at a million dollars. Unfortunately, the middle road bridge, for example, is probably closer to two or half or three million. Um, 18 streets, I think about a million, seven, maybe two million now. So for us to do some work in those, obviously much larger projects, and we're gonna have to go out and find some additional funding. Uh, there is a lot of bridge funding, however, uh, in the current bills. So hopefully we'll get a better handle on that. I'd be so better to get it done on it, it might federal be, money as soon as we as soon as we meet that threshold i think for the city bridge program because we really hate to just give up that million that we're automatically eligible for uh and we'll know that when we do redo our ratings this coming year. okay and that might be as we talked about uh when we go to dc um that might be there are additional transportation funds available and i think we still qualify as an as a rural it just depends state. on what program Yep, so some we right. do, some we don't. If they throw in an urbanized area, we don't. Uh, if they don't have that requirement, we do. Um, 
but the DOT, I think, is finally starting to figure out how to disperse this money, and it'll be getting down to the MPOs, and we'll be finding out a lot more in the next couple of months. Um, yep. Sidewalk program includes both, so if the numbers look a little different, that includes <coughs> both uh, sidewalk and repairs to rec trails. So annually, there's been 250,000 <coughs> sidewalks and 50,000 in rec trails. Um, the rec trail one is simply a placeholder for emergency repairs. Some years, we've spent two-thirds of that. Some years, we've spent very little. Um, but it, it really just depends on weather and uh, the kind of year. So why do we need four this year? So that was a carryover from previous, uh, I don't remember what we added. We pulled from some other programs uh, that came in under this fiscal year. Uh, there was a large section, uh, a couple of larger sections of sidewalk that made sense since we were in geographic location that we wanted to get done. Okay. And remind us of the trail sections that got done. Are we now from um, Halcyon Park to Devil's Glen? Is that the next stage, or is that done? Of the Duck, the Duck Creek Trail? Duck Creek oh, trail. Uh, so the resurfacing, uh, we're done from everything west of 23rd Street. So now we need to consider looking at 23rd to the east, east, which east isn't in nearly as bad a shape as, as those two were. So that's currently not funded with anything there. We, we don't have any additional Duck Creek funding right now. Okay. Uh, alley program, we did have to, yet again, we had some underruns on some other projects carried over from last year. Um, that's why we were able to add uh, an additional alley in um, this year, trying to leverage this year's dollars uh, yeah. that was bid last year, and we're talking construction year versus fiscal year. So that's why that shows a little higher, but otherwise we'll stick with the 450. Um, I think we've got about 18 alley segments left. Uh, we've done 47, I think so, 46, 47. Highly successful program and really want to see that through to the end. Um, again, if, if prices come back down, we'll finish that sooner, um, but most likely we're going to carry out to those out years. Uh, resurfacing is actually a total of a million, so this only shows geo money. So we've been supplementing uh, or proposed to supplement resurfacing and patching programs specifically with road use dollars. So the resurfacing will stay at a million dollars, which is what we've had. Um, unfortunately, there, it's just not going nearly as far as it has been. You know, we're, we're at least one standard street that I would say on the range of four to 600 feet, let's say. We're, we're, we're one less this year for sure. Um, just because of the uh, inflation costs, and, and that could continue. Uh, we're hearing 10% rise in concrete next year. I'm not really sure on asphalt prices. Um, so that, that million, unfortunately, is still not going nearly as far. Um, you know, this year's resurfacing program, we did all of um, the Oak Brook neighborhood, north of, uh, north of Middle, just east of 74. You can kind of picture that, you know, the cul-de-sac and the two turnarounds there, that ate up 80% of our budget this year. You know, I know a couple other ones we've talked about, uh, Metal, Metal Circle and Park Lane Circle, south of middle, that are absolutely in drastic need. That's pushing $2 million at this point with the, the increases that we've seen. So um, I think maybe to the mayor's point of, you know, are we able to reduce some of those? I think probably on the arterial collector, for sure, once we get through what we want to get done. But I think some of that money absolutely is going to have to get shifted into these locals because uh, it's just not going nearly as far as we'd like to. <clears throat> Um, reconstruction program, so the, I should say the resurfacing program is local asphalt streets. So that's that's what we're doing there. Um, some of it is true resurfacing. You're grinding off some of the existing surface, replacing it. Um, we've got a lot of older, and we've eaten through a lot of these in the last couple of years, but a lot of older asphalt streets that are maybe four or five inches of asphalt on dirt. So the minute we try to strip that off, it completely fails. So it's kind of morphed into a bit of an asphalt <coughs> reconstruction program. It just depends on the streets that we have for the year. Um, reconstruction program is our standard concrete local street reconstruction, so that will stay at a million as well. Um, patching program is actually being reduced a little bit for a couple years because we do need some additional funding, and that's one that the need is always going to be there, but we can, um, we can tailor that a little bit uh, to help our needs on some of these larger commitments that we have. So that does go down for a little bit and then comes back up in the, in the out years. Arterial collector is, is our monster. You know, that's, a, that's our biggest one. That is Forest Grove and Middle. So total, if you include both the, uh, 
Poor scrub in the middle, the various phases that we've had out there. You know, we got three active contracts right now. We've got the, the federal aid contract, um, the phase three project. We've got the FG80, which is the sewer and storm sewer project uh, related to the Kellner development in, in Gratz. And then we have the competition drive. Um, so those two, everything east of middle, happy to say, is completely wrapped up. They are basically getting ready to pull equipment out. The road is done, all the sewer is done. That's that's um, been a huge success, and that'll stay closed uh, right now until we have the need to close middle and forest, uh, which will be happening sooner than later. But right now, we're targeting a date after the holidays. We want to get through uh, through the end of the year, and then look at uh, what Valley can do through the winter. Um, the phase three stuff, the Valley construction is doing. Uh, last concrete pour um, will be tomorrow morning, and then we're targeting next Monday to be able to reopen the the Friendship intersection. Uh, which is long overdue. We've ran into a lot of complications with sewer and uh, material availability and you name it, uh, utility conflicts. But um, once we get through here, this was a, this was a very busy 800 foot or so. Um, like I said, with the utilities, we had gas and electric and comms and you name it that we ran into. Their hope is they can keep working through the winter. Um, obviously it won't be paving, but there's a lot of pipe work to do and you can do that in the winter. So the fact that we'll have that friendship intersection open and we've got the new competition, the plan will be sooner than later to shut Forest and Middle, and that becomes your east-west detour. Any, any of those uh, unforeseen problems relative to the consultant that did the design work? Uh, they were not. They were uh, mid-am, unfortunately, not having accurate locations and depths for what they right. had. Um, actually, we've had a very successful set of plans so far. Okay, thanks. Brent, maybe we could, um, maybe at the next meeting, we could have an actual near map presentation sure. of the detours and how that's going to work. So if you're northbound on middle, how you get to I-80 and... Absolutely. Uh, how yep. you... We are uh, meeting tomorrow with HDR and their STRATCOM team. We're going to finalize those graphics and they'll get pushed out through Angie's team uh, as well as our Forest Grove website later this week. Would be great to be able to show the council exactly what's going to how that's going to transpire. Absolutely. Um, a couple things also in the arterial collector. You know, it's uh, of the FY23 dollars that you're seeing, almost 13 million. 10 million of that is <coughs> Forest Grove. Um, and that's 10 million from the city's end, not including the federal aid money that is left. So that was about a $6 million federal aid award, 5.97. Uh, we've spent maybe 2 million of that. So you got about three, three and a half maybe. Uh, that's still left there, so that gets you to that, really, to that 13 million. Are you tracking what it's costing us over and above what it would have been had we passed to, to swap out that? No real way to track it with swap. Um, okay. I would love to. No, I'm <laughs> pissed off. I would absolutely love to. Not at anybody here. <laughs> um, we've got about 30 million total investment out there. Um, so that includes all the projects that we've talked about. There's still one more phase of road to be bid uh, this winter, which would go from the east side of middle on Forest Grove um, to the end of the FG80 property. So that'll get you through one more roundabout of competition and then taper out. Um, that's all included in the development agreement and that's in these numbers. So that'll get bid this year and that should, everything should be wrapped up next year. Um, we've had a lot of discussions with the contractors and I think we've worked out a lot of things um, that moving forward, I expect a, a much smoother and more efficient project. Um, Below the arterial collector, Bedbridge. Um, we know that's a, another big one out there as well. And that includes trails too. Correct? Yes, yep, absolutely wanted to say. So it's, you can see we've got about a $10 million price tag. That's what we had submitted uh, for our Destination Iowa grant. Um, that includes design of the bridge, that includes construction administration of the bridge, that includes the bridge itself, and includes a very large amount of trail so we don't end up with a bridge to nowhere. Um, there's about a million dollars in trails just to fill the gap um, heading east to Forest Grove School. So as part of all of our road projects, we're building trails, but there will be a gap across the, the Ben Horse property that um, still exists there. So we would hope to fill that gap. Uh, and it would also include filling the gap down Middle Road to connect to Hopewell. You know, we'd really hate to build all these trails in and around the area and then not be able to get to it. Um, so some of that is, or all that is included in there. The question, my recollection was uh, the last time we talked about a pedestrian bridge, we were talking about $3 million. 
What's the current number for the bridge itself? So the bridge itself is six and a half, seven million. The so initial e, the initial EDA grant that we submitted, um, me if wrong, was six million total. It project. was just under six million on that, project. and that was the federal EDA, not the state. Correct. Just under six. Now that also, when we submitted that one, had very little design. So now that they've actually done a little bit of schematic design to detail it, and we've also had. <clears> a year and a half worth of construction cost increase, unfortunately. So that, that is the current cost, and obviously we predicated a lot of that initially on the ability to obtain some grant funding, and that has not come to, <coughs> come to fruition, excuse me. We're still working on that. Yeah, we gotta go back to that. <coughs> okay. uh, traffic, kind of the same, um, the same general amounts you see. There's a little bit of an increase in 23 and 25, because there's new traffic signals being constructed. So 23 would include the middle and 29th that's about to go live. And 25 has uh, a new signal at Devil's Glen and Forest Grove that we project will be needed by that point once we complete all the improvements to Devil, or to Forest Grove and middle. <coughs> or, I'm sorry, Devil's Glen and Forest, Forest Grove. Grove. Yep. Is that is that gonna be when, the, when it's widened or before that? That would probably be before that. Actually, per the, the schedule that we have laid out in the CIP, that would be before that. When when do you think that would happen? Right now it's in 25. Okay. Can we project that? All right, thank um, you. The signal's in 25, not the widening. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Signal. Yeah, the widening's a couple years after that. And and honestly, when we go into the detour next year, um, we're going to have a year, uh, a continued year of having to detour traffic down to Forest Grove and Devil's Glen. Um, but that also has an opening now east-west. We may have to have to do something out there. Um, we're not going to put up a temporary signal, but we may have to throw up temporary stop signs or something if the traffic volumes get as heavy as they might. We'll have to see how how people choose to go. It's a lot easier to get on there now that Forest has been closed. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Absolutely. You just yeah. leave it that way. <laughs> that 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 might be a, a strong four way stop, Brent, in the interim with it, with flashing yeah, with three flashing three lights. Talking talking through and we just got to see kind of like the discussion we had earlier though right. we just got to see what the traffic which way people go uh, yeah right, right. I'm it's sorry. hard to get no I'm, they I'm, go east I'm or they go west in my head. I'm in the it's, right hard, it's hard to go west from devil's Glen. <clears throat> yeah during mm -hmm. normal Safely. traffic considerations sure so those are kind of the the very high level silos um do we want to go into any more detail, we'll kind of leave it up to... Well, I think guys. all we're doing tomorrow is setting a public hearing, and you've got the stuff here to look at. There's certainly... I went through, I've got some questions on circled some things, but remember, we get to spend the weekend together going mm. through these things. So um, does, oh, does anybody have any specific questions on specific things tonight? Give us an opportunity to look at it. You don't have to go through and say what... We know what Boulevard Restoration Offset and funding from grading permit g generally is, <laughs> and there's not a lot of money there. I don't see a line item, Your Honor, for boulders. <laughs> They've disappeared. You know, so. You do see the guardrail, oh, but <laughs> that's <the> insult to injury. <laughs> boulders look a lot better down in I seventy four. Yeah, there you go. Sir, they even retiring employees a clock. Give them a boulder with their name engraved on it. <laughs> I think they like the clock. Leave it out in the parking lot. <laughs> yeah, you poor guy. The boulders. Was, oh boy, it was a good idea at the time. We got it done. Any questions about anything else specific? You can take a look at it. Obviously, everybody's open to talking to you, but we should talk about any, like, real concerns about amounts of money together. Um, are we good with this is your presentation for tonight? Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Gentlemen, well, thank you very much. So, Your Honor, Specific questions will we'll come to you. Tomorrow night, we're going to set the public hearing on the right. budget. You've got your dates for the budget. We'll be here at least for that Saturday, and we'll get the Monday presentation. That's when you'll get all of this. You'll also get the other side of the revenue and expenses. Lisa, do you have anything, any questions? Nope. No. Okay. All right. So our presentations have been completed. Are there any operational items on tomorrow night's agenda any particular council member would like to discuss at this time? Any items to be added? All right, I'd like to entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. We stand adjourned. Tomorrow night, we do have a very special mayor. Yeah, we have for a the mayor, day. For, mayor for the day tomorrow night. He's actually a mayor. 
Mike Tomes will be joining us. I'll be taking him to dinner before. He will have lots of questions for the rest of you. He spent a pretty penny to spend an, uh, an evening with me to Rivermont Collegiate. Of course, his grandkids <laughs> go to school there, but we'll have some fun. I may sit in the peanut gallery and let him run the meeting. Let's see if we can get it done. <laughs> <in a few minutes. laughs>